Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Horse Geeks podcast. I'm Kirsten Nelson, professional horse trainer. And with me today is Sam McLean of Red Dog Ranch, who is a heart math specialist and body worker. So today's topic is to talk about the type of body work that Sam does and revisit the concept of heart math, which we did a podcast on earlier. And I can't remember exactly the number of the podcast, but I know it was titled Heart Math, if anybody's interested in looking back for that podcast. Um, Before we get started, I have a very exciting announcement that the Horse Geeks podcast is now available on Apple Podcasts. You can find it through Google and um, the Spotify is pending, but it should be on Spotify pretty soon. And these, we're going back to episodes, um, the earliest episodes. So we started with one through eight. And as there's room, we will get more and more of the episodes uploaded. So on YouTube, today's episode is number 53. And on Apple Podcast, it's just going to be one through eight until I get the next upload done. So just so everybody knows, I know people have been asking if, Horse Geeks podcast will be available on podcast platforms. And as of today, August 8th, 8 8, they are. So let's get started with um, we talked about heart math before. So let's start with what kind of body work you do on horses. What does body work mean and what do you do specifically? Yeah, it's um, body work can mean so many different things. And um, it's really exciting because so many of the human forms of body work are now coming into the equine world. Um, Such as? uh, So cranial sacral, um, uh, baral. I mean, there's a lot of um, kind of niche Um, European, um, more European based body work methods that are now starting to be introduced um, into the horse world and over here in the States. Um, But we have, um, so I am, I am trained in acupressure and that's really where I started. And it's still, um, it's still the foundation of what I do um, is based in Chinese medicine. And Chinese medicine has various branches. And uh, one of those branches is acupuncture. And the branch that I am near, that I practice and is near and dear to my heart is acupressure. It's basically the same thing, except Uh, Since I'm not a veterinarian, um, I can't insert needles. And so instead of needles, I use pressure either with my hands and fingers, or sometimes I have little tools that I might use instead. Um, I have, it's called a teshin, and it's a, a little piece of metal that will also stimulate the point externally. Um, so but it's I, still the I, same yeah. study of the meridians exactly. and the points and all of that, the yep. same as acupuncture. Exactly. Yep. Um, and then, so if it's kind of layered, so if uh, Chinese medicine is the foundation of what I do, then on top of that, I also really love myofascial release. It's probably my next go to modality that I do. What is um, myofascial and, release? What is it? What does it do or how does it work? So um, the last few years, there has been an explosion of information about fascia in our body. And myofascia release is basically um, methods of releasing fascia that has been um, restricted or is um, is not mobile or is not fluid due to hydration loss or um, really restricted because of injury or trauma. And um, the science of fascia is fascinating because um, for years and years and years, um, 
the medical establishment never really thought twice about fascia. It was always something that kind of like the, uh, if you peel the skin off of a, a piece of chicken, that stringy stuff between the skin and the meat of the chicken, um, all of the medical establishment would just throw that away if they were doing surgery. It just was like leftover gunk that nobody needed. But um, a few years ago, there was a researcher who actually looked at living fascia. Um, and if you're interested, um, the there's a beautiful YouTube video. Um, let me pull it up so I can tell you the exact name. It's called Strolling Under the Skin. Um, Dr. Jean-Claude, and I will destroy the last name, I'll spell it for you, G-U-I-M like Mary, B-E-R-T-E-A-U. And it's a 28 minute video that shows this beautiful fluid matrix of fascia. And um, fascia is basically um, 90 percent water and then some collagen and elastin and it's basically um, and a connective it, tissue correct fascia is basically a um, connective tissue so it is connective tissue but the way we think of connective tissue really does not do it justice uh, fascia is everywhere in the body yes Excuse me, I just dropped my pen. Um, I like to think of it as um, almost the internet of the body because of the water involved. There's electro currents that run through the fascia. Um, it, um, it's the way for the body to exchange information. And so that's why um, in body work, I can be working on something in the hind end and it will impact the jaw or vice versa. So it's the network, it's the network highway to exchange information and data across the body. It literally connects, connects the body from every single angle and plane to the other. Um, and if we think back to tensegrity, I was just going to say that. Fascia. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So it's the fascia that actually holds up the bony structures so that we have form. And without that fascia, we would have a bunch of bones laying on the ground. Right. As so, part of the, like in a tensegrity structure, we have the compression elements and the tension elements. And I think all of the soft tissues of the body being part of that tension element, but fascia, what just fascinated me about what you said is to think of it like, because it also conducts water, that it's like mm -hmm. an information highway of electrical impulses throughout the entire body, which is wrapping that tensegrity structure, which is sort of making right. the connection between all the different pieces. Yes. And then on top of it, um, for me, and for, because of my love of Chinese medicine, there is a very unique connection between the fascial lines and the meridians of Chinese medicine. Oh, interesting. They're very, yes, they're very similar. And so um, there is an author by the name of Dr. Daniel Keown. Um, this book is called Spark of the, the Spark in the Machine. And he is a medical uh, physician, um, allopathic physician, as well as an acupuncturist. And he he was the first person um, that connected the fascial lines and the meridians in Chinese medicine for me. Interesting. Um, and it's, yeah, it's so I will get which totally makes sense. when we're finished up, I will get these YouTube, the YouTube video and the book 
title and author in the description box and the show notes. So if you guys can't write this down because you're driving, don't worry about it. It'll be in the notes. Great. But yeah, you're mentioning some fantastic books. I'm like scribbling notes as fast as I can. <laughs> yeah. Um, but one of the things that is remarkable in this particular book is that he talks about um, the development of the embryo and how the fascia is one of the first things that is established and then the and it's the fascia that wraps all the muscles all the cellular networks um, it's actually the fascia through which the bones appear and so the fascia is literally everywhere mm. there's no place that is not fascia in our body and so when we talk about myofascial release, um, the intention is to um, release that fascia that has been restricted, or if there's fluid loss, hydration loss, um, if there is too much compression, which in horses we see a lot because of um, ill saddle fit, right, of the back. Um, so I was going to mention, like in necropsies of horses, if you peel back the skin layer across the back and hindquarter, the fur, all you see are sheets of white fascia. Mm -hmm. Like that is mm -hmm. the first layer right under the skin. And I don't know if it's thicker in horses compared to other species, but I was really taken with sort of the thickness and toughness of that layer oh, of yeah. fascia. Very, yeah. very strong. And, yeah. and so the, what you're saying with myofascial release is that there can be dysfunction in the fascia, mm -hmm. in the use of the yes. fascia. Okay. So what are some of those yes. dysfunctions again? So, um, so think of it like, um, uh, let's say you have a glass bowl and you want to use the microwave to defrost a bunch of peas and you put saran wrap over the top of it and you put it in the microwave and you hit a minute and then you pull it out of the microwave because you cooked it too long. And if you've ever seen the, um, the plastic wrap, it gets sucked into that. Oh um, yeah, food. the bowl. Mm -hmm. So in this case, it's frozen peas. Right. And so you'll see all the peas and the, the skin of that plastic is just super tight. And if you try to pull it up, it, it doesn't pull up. You actually have to pierce the plastic or unfold it to allow that um, air to escape. So um, fascia um, can experience the same thing, either through trauma, overuse, um, lack of hydration, um, holding. So in horses, um, if a, a muscle is held in tension over a period of time that's too long for the horse without rest, right, that will also cause dysfunction. Um, so and that so, fascia. Sorry. I, um, so yep, what no, you're describing, ahead. would that is that what's also known as fascial adhesions, like a fascia adhesion? Yeah. I've heard that yes. term related to fascia. Okay, yeah. so yeah. that's basically yeah. what so, you're describing, like the plastic wrap sucking against the bowl or sucking down into the bowl mm -hmm. is the fascia sort of contracting and getting glued to the muscle like an adhesion. Right, Okay. and so because fascia is everywhere, it's also, it also surrounds our internal organs. And so that adhesion, so a lot of times you'll hear about adhesions, um, let's say uh, with geldings, if they have really severe gelding scars, right? They might have fascial adhesions due to that. Or um, mares will maybe have fascial adhesions due to tumors um, around their um, female reproductive organs. So um, those adhesions can happen almost anywhere. Scar tissue. Um, I'm constantly recommending clients 
um, work that scar tissue because that adhesion, um, it might look small and it might be, let's say on the fetlock, cause you know, that sometimes happens where a horse um, might be striking at a fence and it cuts itself, right? Mm -hmm. And everyone thinks, oh, it's just, you know, it's on a fetlock, it's not a big deal. But that tiny little adhesion, it's, it's almost like if I took this part of my shirt and wound it around really tightly, I can feel that stretch over here. On the other side, yeah. And it's the, <clears throat> right, it's the same thing that's happening with scar tissue. I've also and, found where I've run into fascial adhesions in a training level most of the time is mostly around the horse's scapula and shoulders. That if they're overbearing weight on both front legs or more one front leg than the other, those shoulder, the whole scapula will feel sort of glued into the body, which is all of that fascial adhesions. And it can yes. be really uncomfortable for the horse to then lengthen stride. Oh or push up. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Or, or use their sling muscles to support the rider. Right. Right. And you can, and so that's a perfect example of this suction image that we had with that saran wrap or plastic wrap over those frozen peas. Because when it sucks down into those frozen peas, you can see all the little bumps of the peas. So if you look at the side of the horse and you see this, um, the striations in that shoulder area that look very sharp and jagged, and you can see that scapula. And well-defined. Mm -hmm. Very well defined. Um, you can see the infraspinatus and the supraspinatus muscles popping out. When you see that, or any other muscles, I, this also happens a lot with the hamstring muscles and the hind end. Mm -hmm. When I see those muscles popping out at me, that is a huge indication that that fascia is not healthy. And I, again, that image of that saran wrap where it's just sucked, right? Yeah. It's that superficial fascia. Well, and looking at the body development, the muscles are always developing to support the most habitual coordination of the skeleton. So fascia being part of that, like I'll tell people a lot, if you, if your horse looks like a bodybuilder and you can see lines of muscle definition, I go, that's not healthy horse muscle. And that's the same thing you're saying, but not only is it not healthy development of muscle, but now we have a secondary issue of those fascial adhesions where we see overdeveloped muscles or underdeveloped mm -hmm. muscles. Because healthy right, muscle right. development in a horse to me should be one long smooth body from nose to tail without lumps and bumps yes. and muscle definition. Yes. Right. And then the, the, the texture of the tissue. As a body worker, um, oftentimes, especially after the first session, the, the um, guardian will say to me, well, what can I do in between a session to help my horse? And the first thing I say is get to know how your horse's body feels. Yes. Because people often don't know, well, no. what does a tight muscle feel like? What does a healthy muscle feel like? Yeah. And no, so in the analogy I to... use all the time, and you can tell me if this is accurate or not, but the analogy, like when people are cooking a steak, back to food again, mm -hmm. um, you know, we can use the soft spot between our thumb joint and our first finger with a little fleshy bit. And you can, mm -hmm. if you push on it, that's how you kind of know the feeling of whether your steak is, you know, rare or medium rare or well done. So as you tighten your hand, it mm -hmm. feels less springy, less buoyant. If you relax right. the muscle, it feels yep. more like raw meat. And I said, the muscle should feel more like raw meat. It shouldn't feel mm -hmm. like a well done or medium steak. And would you say that's right. accurate? Because I said that a lot. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's, it's awesome. Yeah. 
Um, and so we will spend time touching different body parts on the horse so they can feel that difference. Um, and even along the back where that where there is that really tough fascia, um, it still should feel pliable. And all too often, it literally will feel like the back of a book or that I could, you know, drop a penny or a drum. If you think about if you've ever, you know, played a drum, even as a little kid, mm -hmm. um, that tight, tight, pulled tight sense, um, that back should not feel like that. Right. Or the neck or the shoulders or, or the neck, hamstrings. Anything. Yeah. 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 And, and that's, I often will, because I'm with you, I love that you use the word guardian. I still use the words horse owner, but same thing that they're often really surprised. Number one, that they can tell the difference with their hands. And number mm -hmm. two, that there are differences throughout the body. So like sometimes the shoulder muscle will be more ideal. It'll be soft and pliable and kind of squishy like raw meat. But then I go now feel the neck or the upper back or wherever the problem is. And everybody can feel the difference. This is not rocket mm -hmm. science. It's like it's right. a tactile oh. sensation that you can't miss. Right, right. Yeah. And it just takes, it, it literally just takes you being mindful and practicing and just getting in the habit of doing that. Um, I agree. Everybody can tell the difference. And it's funny because usually then when we go through a couple of different areas, they're like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. Yeah. And so e even if people just started becoming more attuned to their horse's bodies in terms of heat, where do you feel heat? Do you feel cool? Is it, what's the texture? Tight? Um, is it um, rigid? Is, can you, f if you go across the muscle, does it feel like guitar strings mm. or is it really pliable and fluid and squishy? You don't want those guitar strings. If you can feel guitar strings, that that's tissue that is not well hydrated and not healthy. Interesting. And usually usually the place um the place that is screaming the place that is always telling you i'm hurt is the symptom or the compensation and not the root cause usually so i think i followed you what you mean by that is, let's say the horse is showing visible, gradable lameness on the left front, that that's the mm -hmm. symptom. Mm -hmm. And that's not the cause of, that's not the root cause. It's more of a symptom that we have it's to trace a back, a compensation. Right. So right. that we have to trace back through the tensegrity system to find mm -hmm. other weak links or other issues. Right. Is that what you meant by and that? Again, exactly. Okay. Yep. And because of that fascia, um, and now we have here, I'll show you, I'll share another great book. Um, this book, Equine Myofascial Kinetic Lines um, for Professionals, but anyone who's interested in fascia and horses. Um, uh, this is an amazing book. So we have these equine researchers who have now, similar to what um, Tom Myers has done with um, human anatomy trains, um, these researchers, um, Rika Schultz, uh, Vibika Elbrand, and Tove du Due, um, have done for the horse. And so, so it's we, specific to uh, horses. It, yes, it's specific to horses. Well, it's in the um, title, Equine Kinetic Lines for Equine Professionals. Got it. Um, so we, we can now look at these lines through the body to better understand where 
um, where that compensation um, might be connected to a potential root cause. And I'm not saying it's always the case, but more often than not, as a as a body worker, when I say when I see that um, lame right front, I don't just look at that lame right front. I'm looking at the whole horse because the whole horse is connected to that lame right front. So where else in that body is the horse choosing to to use itself to compensate as a result of some issue. And maybe that is, um, maybe that's uh, ulcers. Maybe they're compensating because of ulcers. Maybe they're compensating because of poor teeth. Maybe they're compensating because of um, inflammation and they have well, a bad in my diet. World, in my world, they're compensating because of spinal dysfunction in motion mm -hmm. or poor spinal yeah. coordination. But yeah. it's I, what I was thinking too is how different, it's such a different perspective from veterinary perspective. Not that it's better, better or worse or greater or lesser value, but vets are coming in and looking at that lame right front leg and they wanna find the pathology. They wanna see mm -hmm. what's not correct inside that right front leg, which, half the time there might be an issue, like um, there might be sure. a, an abscess or there might be a stone bruise. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's why the horse is lame on the, it's an injury, right? Yeah. And so the vets are trained to go in and look at what's broken with the piece that is showing pain. And you're coming in mm -hmm. with a totally different perspective going where the pain is manifesting might not be the root cause, it might be the effect. So you're looking more globally through the whole body, which as right. a trainer is yep. what I'm looking at is during training, are we exacerbating dysfunctional use of the body, which will always lead mm -hmm. to pain issues, or are we helping our horse learn a higher, better coordination based on the design of the body? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. same thing. It's, yeah. it, and yeah. it's very important. I go because horse owners can do a lot of rehab work themselves. And the main difference. Oh, absolutely. I go, if I have a lame horse, of course, I'm going to call the vet. I'm not going to not call the vet. Right. I go, we have all of these options, allopathic and holistic at our disposal. So why not use the whole smorgasbord if we're here to help our horse? Mm -hmm. And if the vet can't find anything wrong, the lameness gets put in a category called idiopathic lameness, unknown origin. And that can become mm -hmm. a chronic lameness or it can be intermittent. And those are the lamenesses where the vets don't have the best tools that's where I would bring in a body worker or look at how the horse is actually coordinating functions in yep. movement. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, and that's, the, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say it's the idiopathic lamenesses that devalue the horse. Mm you know, mm -hmm. or concussive lamenesses like navicular or ring bone or side bone mm -hmm. that, you know, or kissing spine that all devalue mm -hmm. the horse incredibly and give you a pasture ornament. And those are all functional repair jobs. Yeah. Well, and those also make me think of proprioception, which mm -hmm. is which is another key piece to fascia. Fascia, again, if you, we talked earlier about, you know, the, the fascia being kind of this connection highway of exchanging information from one area of the body to another area of the body. So that proprioception, if a horse um, does not have good proprioception, whether it's because of an injury or maybe really poor hoof care, right? The mm -hmm. toes are too long um, or the, the teeth, if they haven't had their teeth um, floated 
uh, balanced properly, um, all of that changes the body's way of understanding itself in space. Right. And so, and proprioceptors. Sorry, proprioceptors, just to make sure I'm on track, are the sort of, how do I want to say, they're like the balancing mechanism in every muscle of the body. Alert, uh, kind of pulled together to tell us where we are in time and space. That that's the mm -hmm. body intelligence through the muscles versus the ocular vestibular sense of balance, which is the eyes and the ears. Proprioceptors right. are actually right. in the muscle as a per balance, per uh, how do I want to say, perceptor. Yeah, and actually what they, they've now done some new research, uh, this research um, is in humans, but I'm assuming that it's the same thing in horses, um, that uh, fascia actually has the most number of nerve receptors in the whole entire body in fascia. Wow. And so those proprioceptive um, receptors are not just in the muscles, they're in the fascia as well. And so those um, proprioceptive receptors, um, it's, they are picking up on um, on vibration, they're picking up on compression, they're picking up on force. And some of those proprioceptive receptors um, in extreme cases could change over to nociceptors, nociceptors, which that's where we get into um, pain. And so if a horse does not have good proprioception, for a variety of different reasons, then the brain will start to interpret things as a way of protecting the body as pain. Interesting. And so again, we go back to this fascia needing to be healthy in order for the horse or human, right? Or dog or cat or whatever um, to move and understand where and how it's moving in space. And so is it a manual manipulation, kind of like a muscle massage that you do to restore the functionality of fascia? So it's because it, it is so it can, close it, and intertwined yeah. with muscle. Yes, yes, it is. Um, it, it can be, I, um, most of the time, um, what seems to be um, most impactful is very slow, deep, um, I, I'm even hesitant to say pressure because um, it's a different type of pressure than if you think about massage pressure. Um, it's a it's a it's a more of a compression that allows the the fascia to rehydrate and relax. It will oh, look a lot of times. It'll look a lot of times like I'm not doing a lot because the movement is either so slow or so subtle. Um, I was trained in the John and Mark Barnes um, myofascial release system. Um, a, a, the trainer is Tamara Thomas. Um, there are lots of other types of myofascial release. Um, I uh, tend to gravitate to body work that is um, the type of body work that's softer, where you go in, you go with the ease of the body versus going against what the body's asking for. Right. I think there are oftentimes um, really good reasons to be more um, forceful and go against and go um, go against a brace. Um, but in my experience, and again, this is just me. There's lots of different body work. Um, the fascia releases best in this slow, 
um, deep compression. Uh, compression. Yeah. Yeah. So like in chiropractic work, let's say there's a subluxation, you're going, what you mean is that's a modality where you're going against the path of least resistance to put the bone back fully in the joint. Yeah. As or opposed, even, um, as or opposed even like to moving points. with the body or trigger points. Okay. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. So a lot of um, a lot of basic sports massage, equine sports massage. There's a, some really wonderful programs out there. You can do a four day week long training for equine sports massage, and so they'll, you know, they'll teach you how to do trigger point um, releases. And oftentimes those are super super helpful, very helpful uh, for a localized area you know, for humans. So if you, you just start massaging up here for most of us because of COVID who've been sitting in front of our screens for the last two years, right? And we have this horrible posture. Doing some trigger point therapy can be super effective. That tight spot um, on the back of your shoulder, yes. Total, yes, completely. Um, so there, there are reasons for doing a lot of this different um, type of body work. Um, for me, the myofascial release and the acupressure because they look at the whole horse and it's that holistic view and it's not just that singular muscle group or that singer, singular trigger point um, that's taken into context with everything else that's going on with the horse. Those two are such a beautiful blend for me. Um, those, those two are where most of my work comes from. And then I'll add in um, a lot of T-touch. I do a, a lot of T-touch also. Again, it's very gentle. Um, it's, um, I think it's, uh, I think Linda Tellington Jones has done a fabulous job of integrating her understanding of um, Feldenkrais um, to work with the horse. Um, and it, it blends beautifully with um, myofascial release too. So yeah, -touch because my understanding of T-touch is basically proprioception interrupted, that, that you're sort of stimulating with the T-touch to alter the current proprioception, which is a little bit askew or compromised and mm -hmm. sort of hoping mm -hmm. to reset or reboot the nervous system, so to speak back into a healthier proprioception. Is that accurate for what yeah. T-touch is? Um, you know, it's it's a really uh, fascinating way that you described it. And um, I guess it could be called, it could be described that way. I always think of T-touch as um, a great way of just connecting the, the body mind because everything is so gentle. Um, and um, that attention and intention um, that happens between the body and the mind, I think is, is really key for the T-Touch program. But Which I, is exactly, the way that, I could, yeah. Well, because you're talking about three things, really, if we boil it down, you're talking about the electrical system of the body. Mm -hmm. So whether we're talking yep. fascia or acupressure or T-Touch, you're looking at the receptor cells within the nervous system to organically sort of guide the body back away from injury or trauma to restore that blueprint of healthy use. And so yeah. I think all yeah. three that you're talking about really tie into each other. And yeah. I was going to yeah. mention, it was, it's always been as a trainer, well, as a trainer specializing in sort of biomechanics and coordination and motion. One of the things that I found frustrating with body workers was having a body worker come in of any modality that works in a way to restore suppleness or healthy function leaves with the horse in an unstable state. And yes, I find that right. more with kind of manual manipulation therapies. I find that much more prevalent. And when you're working like you are on the electrical system of the body and you're very slow and non-invasive, 
those are the modalities where I don't come in the next day as a trainer going, oh my God, this horse is like a noodle. What happened? Mm -hmm. Where Mm -hmm. with some Mm -hmm. manual Mm -hmm. manipulation therapies, you can over massage the muscle. You can release tension Uh Uh that is literally holding that horse together. (laughs) Yes. And it will actually make them more more prone to injury if you release too much tension at once. Yes, yes, 100%. Um, But I, even still with the work that I do, I still have to be very careful. Um, But again, that's why having having this global view of the horse is critical because if I just focus in right on that right front leg where I see the limp or the lameness and I say oh look at these muscles are super tight without really understanding right? How that whole horse is holding him, himself, herself together and how it's all connected. If I just zero in on, let's say those shoulder muscles that look like they're super tight and And they will be super tight. They will be. I, Mm -hmm. I'm going to be doing a huge disservice to that being. Yes. Because you're also very Without the muscle tension, that protective element, that strain is going to fall on the tendons and ligaments. And that horse is suddenly super prone to a more serious injury on top of what's already going on. And Mm -hmm. and that, I think, you know, for horse owners, we have to educate ourselves to be able to choose horse professionals that aren't going to come in and overdo something. Right. right. And over in, in their effort to do a great job, end up doing too much for that individual body, more than the body mm-hmm. can handle at that moment. And right. I find right. with acupressure, which you do, and now that you've explained the myofascial release better, and even the T-touch, I go, that's so non-invasive. Mm-hmm you'd really have to kind of put some serious effort into making the horse unstable (laughs) by working with proprioception. Yeah. 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 Yeah, For sure. That's so fascinating. So is rolfing a a type of myofascial release? Is that a Um, school of it? Okay. Um, Yes. And if, if you, I don't, you know, I'll age myself here, but you know, back in the seventies and eighties, rolfing like if you went to a rolfer they were using elbows and really it was painful it it was super painful right like if you if you had the balls to go to a rolfer (laughs) you know you were gonna get a lot of really heavy duty work and and yet for a lot of people it was super super helpful um i think now um they are less on that, you know, that extreme edge, right, of the super deep, super powerful, I think they've come over a little bit. Um, But yeah, they, they, they are targeting that fascial structure. But now that we have a better understand about a better understanding about what fascia is, and the fluid matrix, and how um, it's called piezo piezoelectricity, um, just a little bit of pressure causing this piezoelectricity to happen that allows that fascia, that signal to go out through the fascia to relax and release it. It doesn't have to be this super deep, intense, traumatic event. Right. No, and part of my list of questions for you today was to ask how what we talked about before, the heart math ties into your other body work modalities. And I, it's so obvious now. It's so obvious mm-hmm. because we're still in the electrical system of the body, the nervous system primarily, yep. which is the nervous system of the body affects all functions of the body. I find it is the most powerful place to work when we're trying to, when I'm trying to overcome behavioral issues, overcome idiopathic lameness, 
or just enhance the coordination of the horse in motion and improve the movement. Mm -hmm. That nervous system and the habits that are ingrained, because we have we have instinctual nervous system patterns, and we also have learned habitual nervous system patterns. And it really is working within the electrical system of the body, the nervous system, where you can alter the habits, which then organically Mm -hmm. alters the functionality. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that's just exactly what you're doing with body work that is It's a very different perspective from veterinarians, but complements it beautifully. It's Mm -hmm. not a one or the other kind of thing. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, no. No, and that's the same thing with my horse training is there are jumping specialists. There are Mm -hmm. reining specialists. But I go, Mm -hmm. I look at those as software program specialists. And what I'm doing Mm -hmm. with training is working on the operating system of the body. And oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Within the operating system, of course, you have an electrical system, just like Mm -hmm. in a car. So if that goes Mm -hmm. out, just like our car, you're kind of (laughs) screwed. If it's dysfunctional, you you can't do anything else. You can't do anything else. Forget the jumping. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 No, 100%. And um, I love. I love your description of the electrical system because ultimately that's what it is. And going back to Chinese medicine, um, if you think about the, the foundation of life in Chinese medicine is qi. And that, that life force uh, for many people is described as electrical. Yeah. And so when you're doing acupressure or you're doing some myofascial release it's working with that chi so i can i can run my hands um, in the very beginning of a session down the horse's back and connect with that tissue and i will be able to feel where that stagnation is i can feel where the tissue doesn't want me to move anymore where it's stuck and Mm. rigid and so in my Chinese medicine world then I think okay there's either stagnation so the flow of chi something it's you know it's stagnated it's not wanting to move or there's a block Mm -hmm. Um, and so then I can go off in a lot of different directions to better understand what that root cause of that block is Absolutely. Like you're like the electrician that comes in and looks at the electrical map for the house and figures out why the lights <laughs> in the living room aren't working. Right. Yeah. You the <laughs> and nothing's going on. Exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. No. And I'm sure that that is you have a higher level of sensitivity in your hands from this work than a lot of people. That's what makes you a true professional with body work is well, that developed uh, sensitivity. It takes, yeah, it takes practice, but everybody can do it. And that's why just get your hands on your horse. Everyone can figure out, everyone can sense if something is warmer or colder. Or softer or harder. Everybody. Or right. softer or harder. If you mm-hmm. just stick with those two, Even if you just do those two before you call your vet and you can describe to your vet just those two things, that that's a big deal. That will help. Yeah. And you learn a lot about your horse. So so we're so quick as humans to just label waywardness in horses as bad behavior. And I have yet to meet a horse on this planet that didn't have a darn good reason for resisting the rider. 100%. Absolutely. Yeah. And so they're not resisting us or not cooperating with us for no reason. There's always a reason, right? That's maybe only logical to the horse in the moment, but we can learn to understand it if we pay attention and we become curious. Right. So before we run out of time, I know you have Mm -hmm. an upcoming workshop. Can So is it, I think your upcoming workshop is on heart math. Is yep. that correct? Um, 
it's a it's a um, it's a course. So it's four weeks long, one evening um, for an hour and a half over four weeks. Um, and each week we um, learn a new heart math technique. We talk a little bit about the science behind heart math, and then um, then in between each class, then hopefully people will practice and we'll come back together and talk about how people did, what kind of an impact it made. Um, and, and is this a the next remote week. course or in person? It's No, it's remote. It's on Zoom. I I know every, a lot of people are really tired with Zoom, but the benefit of Zoom is that people from all over, I've got people in California, um, Florida, and um, somewhere else on the East Coast. So it's wonderful because you get to, you know, do this in the privacy of your own home. It's in the evening. Yeah. You can be lying in your bed. You can be curled up on the couch <laughs> with your dog. Um, and it's something that... Um, anyone can benefit from, not just people who are um, hoping to use this with their animals. Um, just anyone else can. No, my dad, benefit. my elderly father who had triple bypass surgery a couple of years ago, I, hi I sent them your flyer and mm -hmm. really recommended that they attend your workshop. Oh, I don't yeah. know if they signed up or not, but how could people find you um, what's the, is it an easy website, um, for them to go to, to yeah. look at the course and maybe sign up for it? So my website is rdr, red dog ranch, rdrequine.com. There is a brief, uh, description on there, um, for the course, but if somebody um, wants um, specific information, they can just email me at sam at rdrequine.com and just let me know that they're interested and I can give them more information. Okay, and when does this course I, start? I think I have, it starts September 8th. I think I have two or three spots still available. Okay, so September 8th, 2022 because you know videos live yep. forever on YouTube. So um, yes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so if you guys are interested, you can go to Sam's website or the email. And again, I will put all of these details in the description box and in the show notes. So if you want to access it later, right. you can do that. But so we need to wrap it up for today. I'm running out of time, but I am so thrilled having you and we'll have to set up another one. I just love talking to oh, it's you. It's fun. Yeah. I just, you oh, and I love such a to you, wealth so of information. Absolutely. No. Okay. So thank you everybody for joining us for the Horse Geeks podcast. And we look forward to seeing you again in the future. All right. Sounds Thanks good. everybody. Bye Kirsten. Bye.